of the church. You choose either of those spaces, you'll be out of view of the cameras. Hey, let's get to church now. You can. I'll give you. I'll give you permission to use YouTube. Uh, <laughs> well, welcome today to church. It's terrific to see you this morning as we continue to think about love, sex, and marriage. And today we're focusing on uh, the marriage part of that. As Adam speaks to us uh, later on about what is the Bible's view of marriage? What does it look like? We kind of introduced to it last week the whole topic, but uh, how does it how does it work? And how are you going to make it work in the long term? And how does it reflect Jesus Christ? As we saw, that's, uh, that's the issue uh, last week, the two marriages at the start and the end of the Bible. We're going to have a prayer of preparation, is that right? Uh, and we're going to pray this together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing together the praises of our great God and King.
love, for uh, the love that made us in the first place, the love that uh, rescued us when we were in darkness, and your love that continues to teach us to your ways so that we might live wisely for your glory and for the benefit of ourselves and each other and our community. Please mould us today as we uh, deal with this uh, issue of marriage this morning, which our society has uh, got very strange views on at the moment. We pray, please, that we would love your ways and that you would mould us and shape us in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Lord, have mercy on us and write your commandments in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Dave's going to read to us from the scriptures. Good morning. Would you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5? If you are using a Pew Bible, you'll find that on page 1038. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. Pay careful attention then to how you live not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy. And blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we have a look at that together, we're going to stand and encourage each other in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary 
and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning all. Lovely to see you here on this wonderful, warm, okay, cold but sunny day. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the rich blessings you give us in Christ and we thank you for the wonderful gift of marriage. Help us to understand your purposes for marriage. Help us to understand why Christians are so out of step with our society on this issue. Help us to understand why the good gift of marriage is worth Christians standing up for and upholding in a society that will continually look down upon us for listening and obeying and wanting to show your good gift of marriage in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been an interesting week to prepare a sermon on marriage because if you've been watching the national media, you would have seen that marriage has all been all through the media this week over this topic in the place of the manly sea eagles. And you're going, what has rugby league got to do with marriage? And a lot of people have been asking that question as Manly tried to force their players to wear pride jerseys. And when they tried to do that, seven players on their team, so that's more than half of the rugby league team, said, we do not want to be part of your inclusiveness. And so they were excluded. Now, despite the somewhat funny nature of Manly's embarrassment in the whole situation, or the casual racism so many in our so-called progressive media showed towards these backward Pacific Islanders who disagreed with them on marriage, the episode did raise this important question. Why are people who call themselves Christian so out of step with our society about marriage? If you listen to the critiques of the media, they've been asking, if marriage is about love and caring for one another, then why would these backward islanders just bend the knee to our superior Western thinking? Yet so, so many Western thinkers, Western thinkers have failed to grasp is what you think marriage is will be determined upon your purposes you think it serves. So our culture, which thinks marriage is about sexual fulfilment, it defines marriage in this way. They define marriage as a mutually exclusive sexual relationship between two consenting adults that have come together for as long as they agree to stay. That is, and I'll say it again, our culture basically views marriage as two consenting adults coming together for as long as they both agree to stay. Now, that is our culture's basic definition of marriage. Now, Christians have a different view of marriage. We define it differently. And today we're going to look at what Christian definition of marriage is and how it fulfills God's purposes and his good purposes for all creation. Now, as we listen to the talk today, we need to be aware that I have not, nor can I, answer all the questions about marriage. That's Joe's job. 
I'm aware that as I speak, that there is going to be a lot of hurt around the topic of marriage. It is impossible for there not to be. Marriage is the most intimate of human relationships between people. When things go wrong in marriage, there is always a lot of pain. What I'm deliberately doing is setting up an ideal marriage, the standard for marriage. And we need the standard so as to see where the problems are when individual marriages go wrong, so that we can diagnose the problems so as to fix them. So as I set up this standard, do not feel that I am addressing you specifically, that I have you in mind. If you think you have failed to live up to this standard, if you think you have failed to live up to God's standard, join the club because I know that it is me. But that is why God has given us forgiveness through Jesus because we all fail to live up to his standards. But we need to know what is his good standard so that we can diagnose the problems and fix God's good order for or live out God's good order in our lives. So, what is marriage and what are the purposes of marriage? I'm going to start straight off with the definition and this is God's view of marriage and it should be accepted by our whole society. Marriage expresses and reflects God's faithfulness and love to his church through an exclusive, lifelong, loving sexual union between a man and a woman for the raising of children. I'll say that definition again. Marriage expresses and reflects God's faithfulness and love to his church through an exclusive, lifelong, loving sexual union between a man and a woman for the raising of children. That is what God sees as marriage. Now, there are similarities with our culture uh, in terms of its view on marriage, but there are also significant differences. It is those departures which really cause the problems with our society. But God has created marriage with very specific purposes in mind that our society just wishes to ignore. But, and there are three basic purposes that God has set up for marriage. And they are mutual support and care, which our society basically shares, the raising of children, and as an analogy of God's relationship with his people. And I'm going to go through and explain those three purposes. And the first purpose of marriage is the mutual care and support of one another. The marriage, uh, Anglican marriage service puts it like this. It is a lifelong union in which a man and a woman are called to give themselves in body, mind and spirit and so to respond that their union will grow a deepening knowledge and love of each other in the joys and sorrows of life in prosperity and adversity, they share their companionship, faithfulness and strength. Now, as you listen to what the Anglican Church service says, the key words are these, in terms of mutual love, will grow a deepening knowledge and love of each other. Marriage is a relationship which encourages and supports each person within the couple. In marriage, the person whom we should know best, who should know us best, is our spouse. My best friend in life is Trudy. When I feel hurt or I'm confused, when I need to process something, the first person I want to speak to is my beautiful wife. And it's not that Trudy always agrees with what I say. She should. <laughs> but my best and most honest critic in life has always been my wife. Sometimes Trudy has told me the thing I didn't want to hear, but the thing that she knew I needed to hear. That is because she knows my flaws, my strengths, my weaknesses, my sadness and my fears. She knows what intimidates me. 
She knows what I find joy in. She knows, for example, that I'm not a particularly sentimental person so that when I give her flowers that I have really been thinking about her that day. And no matter what, my wife stands beside me. She is there with me through thick and thin. As I am with her, that's what it means to grow in love and knowledge of someone in marriage, to take the time to understand them, to know them, to support them, to be with them, to stand with someone in the good times and in the bad. Marriage is a platform through which to stand together in life through what is the toughest job in the world. And we'll get to that in a second. Marriage forms a union where two different but equal components of humanity come together and in their differences they make up something greater. They make up something stronger. As God has put it, the two become one flesh. Men and women are supposed to be there for each other. And part of that being one flesh is sex. Sex is often, ooh, who's going to talk about sex in church? But sex is a good thing within marriage. The joy of faithful and exclusive sex has been given to us by God for joy. And the joy of sex is meant to flow out into every aspect of our marriages. Sex physically expresses the joy and intimacy of marriage. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, a husband should fulfil his marital duty to his wife and likewise a wife to a husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. This is two people coming together and physically enjoying each other. Marriage couples are meant to have mutually fulfilling sex. Now, we'll look at sex in more detail in a couple of weeks, but sex is God's good gift and has been given for expressing mutual love and affection and joy in the marriage relationship. Sex is supposed to be an act of mutual care for one another. It is supposed to be sacrificial in the sense that it's giving physical com com comfort joy and pleasure to each other. Sex should bond couples together so they can face the world together and the bonding strength for them is to face what is the toughest task in any marriage for have enough sex and assuming everything works medically, then comes the second reason for marriage, children. This is the reason for this platform of marriage relationship. It is to be sacrificially raise the next generation. Marriage is for bringing and raising children in the world. I'm going to read from the book of Malachi and I want you to pay attention to how God moves from the marriage relationship to this purpose for marriage. And this is Malachi chapter 2. This is another thing you do. You are covering the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. And you ask, why? Because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Didn't God make them one and give them a portion of spirit? What is the one seeking? Godly offspring. So watch yourself carefully so that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. It is no accident that in sex, which symbolises the greatest joy and intimacy in marriage, results in the creation of children. Sex within marriage is meant to bring children into the world. And though children are a great blessing from the Lord, they are, no doubt, they are one at the same time, the hardest labour within marriage. 
It is the reason God has set up sex in this way, specifically that humanity cannot have children apart from coming together in sex. Oh, sure, you can at present conceive children in a test tube. Could show you that isn't as fun. But at present, we cannot bring children into the world without a mother. Men and women coming together in marriage is meant to remind us that we cannot get into the future without each other. Without mothers, we have no future. Women have been given the great blessing of bringing life into the world. But just as we need mothers, so also we need fathers. Just last week, if you listened to Joe, you would have heard the figures of the percentage of prisoners that do not have fathers in the home. One child families, which are predominantly single mothers, are severely disadvantaged in homes without biological fathers. Reading the statistics on this from a single parent home, it just brings the truth to light. Children are more likely to develop psychological problems. They're more likely not to finish school. They have more behavioural problems. They are more likely and are generally more impoverished. They are more likely to be abused... Well, they are more likely to abuse alcohol and sexually act out and therefore to have other children which repeat the cycle. Children remind and teach men and women that we need each other because raising children is hard work. I was talking to some of the mothers at the Tuesday morning Bible study. And as I was talking, I made the, I made the offhand quip that, it, you know, getting out of the house with young children was like launching the space shuttle. And then one of them said to me, no, with the space shuttle, at least everybody's on board with the task. <laughs> Raising children is a task that men and women, in the ideal situation, are meant to do together. To say anything other is simply a lie. God has made it this way so that we can learn that we cannot do without each other. So the final purpose for marriage has been that God has set it up to point to his own relationship and his own character with, towards humanity. Marriage is meant to display and reflect the very character of God as he relates to humanity. The two main characteristics that God uh, wants marriage to reflect is his faithfulness and love towards us. God wants people to be faithfully committed to both him and to each other. The faithfulness of the individuals within marriage is meant to reflect God's faithfulness towards people. That is why the Bible teaches the exclusiveness of marriage. The exclusive commitment of the individuals in marriage should reflect Jesus' commitment towards us, his people. Christians should be utterly committed to the biblical understanding of marriage because if Jesus was to give us the heave-ho, as it were, we'd be toast. No salvation. God is faithful and he wants us to be faithful. And we saw that in Malachi. We are to be faithful in marriage all our lives. And it was specifically to men, to the wife of of your youth. The other aspect God wishes to show in marriage is love. And we're not talking about hallmark sentimental love or feelings of love. Love is an unwavering commitment to place the other person's needs above your own desires. Love in the biblical sense is not an emotion. It is an action. Love is something we do. That is not to say that Love is not accompanied by emotions. It can, and in good and right circumstances, it should. That is why people will say sometimes that they love chocolate or they love Coke or they they love whatever. It's because 
when we talk about love that way, we are saying these things bring us pleasure and joy. Okay, if you want to use language that way, that's perfectly fine. But we need to realise that love in a biblical sense means self-sacrificial service. As Christians, we need to use and understand that God, love for God is putting the needs of the other before our own. Marriage should reflect these two characteristics at all times, for the, they are the very core of who God is. That is why God gets so angry with societies that treat mad, marriage badly, because marriage is meant to reflect the very nature and character of who God is. Faithfulness and love, they are the twin poles of marriage. And that is what our marriages as Christians need to be about. And we need to realise that as we look and think about marriage, as we look and think about the goals and God's purposes for marriage, they all work simultaneously. It's not that you can pick and choose like a smorgasbord, which ones I want and which ones I don't. They all work together. And if we don't realise and think, okay, this is God's goal, this is God's purpose for marriage, if we don't set that target, then we're never going to achieve it. So what I've just set down in terms of these goals and purposes it is a standard against which we will measure our own issues and diagnose our own problems because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 there will be plenty of problems in life for those who are married but the married life is a good thing it is a pattern and it's an institution set up by God to achieve his purposes okay so we know God's purposes for marriage what should marriage look like? How has he set it up? And we need to know that marriage is patterned. It is an institution built upon promises. Men and women make promises at the start of marriage which creates the marriage and reflects the structure of marriage of every single marriage. And God has structured us as male and female to achieve his purposes for marriage in creation. So marriage has a structure, a pattern, as Joe has been saying last week, a framework which allows each marriage to achieve God's purposes. And the best analogy I could think of to explain this idea is a house. Look at any house and the first thing you'll notice is that they are all different. But behind their individual differences, they all share the same pattern and structure. They all have floors, they all have walls, they all have roofs. But it is the structure of the house that facilitates its purpose, which is simply to control a small piece of environment and keep people safe from the various effects of weather. That's the purpose of a house. But though every house has the same basic structure, they are yet all different, with each house reflecting the different personalities and needs of the individual marriages living within them. No two marriages will look alike. They all share a similar structure to achieve God's purpose, but that structure serves those three purposes that we looked at. And while sharing the common structure, they will be all different. And the passage that shows this structure is Ephesians 5. And I'm just going to read parts of Ephesians 5 and I'm going to deal with wives first because I'm following the logical order of the Ephesian passage because that's where he, Paul starts and he starts with these words. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. And so we come to the dreaded command, wives, submit to your husbands. And it is controversial in our culture because, and there are two general reasons why people find submission really hard. First, 
we like to control, we like to feel we're in control, and secondly, we like to feel and we believe our value comes from the structures we're in, and if we're below in the structure, it means we're less valuable. And we as Christians have got to go, no, that's not true, that is absolutely ridiculous. The word submit comes from the Greek word hupotasso, and the reason I bring it up because it tells you what it means. Hupo means under, tasso order. It means follow the structure, follow the order. That's all submit means. And so what wives are telling, uh, what Paul is commanding wives to do is to follow the structure, follow the order. Yes, husbands are in control. Husbands are in the top of the order. And so I asked Trudy what she thought it was like to submit to me as her husband. And these are the three things she said. She said, the first thing you've got to listen and realise, it doesn't mean blindly agreeing with everything I say. And I thought, wow, we've got two rules in marriage that we had from the start. And these are the two rules we set up. We said, the first rule is, I am always right. <laughs> and then I said, the second rule, what's the second rule, Trudy said? Oh, the second rule is easy. If I'm wrong, see rule number one. But what she was saying was, it just doesn't mean blindly of following or obeying or just listening to everything I say or doing exactly what I say, but it is, it is listening carefully, loving and thinking through what I'm saying for, and this was her second point, it means trusting me to make the big decisions. When we have a big decision in life, Trudy and I will sit down and we'll discuss it and we'll talk about it for days and then she'll say, eventually a decision needs to be made and Adam, you're going to make it and I'm going to follow you in that. And that has been basically the pattern. It doesn't mean every little decision, Trudy doesn't ring me up and say, oh, I want to buy a chocolate bar, Can you? am I allowed to have a chocolate If she ever did that, I'd just probably hang up the phone. Um, but it means in the big decisions, she will follow my lead. And then this was the third thing she said, and this is something that I'm not really... Uh, re uh, I don't really see it happening in life, but she says it means never putting me down in public, never tearing me down, never making me look bad. She never says a bad word about me in public. She always puts me first. Those are the three things she said of what it means for her to submit to my leadership. And then she said, when she was looking at this passage, she said, well, that's my job, but as I look at the passage, I look at what husbands are called to do, and she goes, I'm glad I'm not the husband because it sucks to be you. And I'm like, why would you say that? And she said, read it. So I will. Husbands... Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Men are meant to lead, but leadership is not telling people what to do. Leadership takes responsibility for caring for those under the structure, in this case, the family structure. True godly leadership serves those who follow. Hence the section on marriage and men's responsibility, the very example of pattern of leadership is Christ's own crucifixion. Jesus lays his life down for his bride. Men do likewise. That is the pattern for leadership in marriage and for life. It is no accident that the first command to husbands as leader in marriage is to love. Husbands lead in love and they do so through the loving example of Christ's death for his church, Christ's self-sacrificial death for his church. As Christ loved the church, so men are to lay their lives down for their wives. That is where our definition of love becomes so important because biblical love is hard work. Biblical love is self-sacrificial. Biblical love 
raises the needs of others above our own. Any marriage, that means that husbands need to put the needs of their wives above their own. That is what the passage means when it says that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and sacrificed himself for her. That takes hard work. That takes resolve. That is what manly, godly leadership is really about. Sacrifice. Taking responsibility for the needs of the family. Seeing that they are met. And especially for the wife. That means financially. The wedding ring, which in our modern marriage services means commitment, but it used to mean that the husband would have everything and take everything he had and buy this little piece of gold which symbolised his willingness to sacrifice for his life. That means for men, what toys do we need to give up because they are a distraction? Or what hobbies take so much of our resources that our wives are missing out? What can we give up? What can we sacrifice to help with our wives in in the budget? Emotionally, take the time to speak to your wives. Put down whatever you're doing and listen. Move away from the computer, the TV, the drill, whatever. What are her interests? What are her concerns? I'm not saying you have to like them or even agree with them, but you should at least know them. Take the time to listen to your wives and spiritually. What is going on spiritually with our wives? Do we know what she's thinking about and listening to? Is your wife interested in a ministry? How can you help her to do it? I know that many times I've stayed behind and looked after the children or done things at the home so Trudy could get out and do the kids' ministry. Men, and I am talking to men here, you are going to need to make sacrifices. And if you think you're going to make big sacrifices in life, well, you better start making the little sacrifices at the home for your wife because the big sacrifices won't come unless you're making those little ones. Men, what do we need to do? What do we need to sacrifice in our lives for our wives' sake? We all know what that is. Will we do it? So having that structure in mind, knowing God's purposes in mind, we need to come to the final two parts. What is the time of marriage? And there's only two final points that I need to be made in terms, and these are quick. The first has to do with a foolish notion of our society, and that is what happens between, in the bedroom between two consenting adults has nothing to do with me. This is absolute nonsense. What is conceived in the bedroom always ends out on the streets. It is just a matter of time. And if we think about it, it is obvious that this is true. For the way we treat the most intimate person in our lives, it will eventually flow out into the way we treat everybody else. We need to uphold this good gift of marriage because that is a true notion. And the final point And I'll conclude with this. Marriage, according to Jesus, is only for this world and not for the world to come. We need to remember in Jesus' argument about the resurrection with the Sadducees, though they had come and said to Jesus and they thought they could disprove the resurrection through the use of marriage, Jesus makes it very clear that marriage is for this age and for this age only. Though marriage is a good gift from God and is the most intimate of human relationships, it is not the most intimate relationship we have. Of all the relationships we can possibly have, the most intimate relationship is the marriage we all share with Christ, our God and our King. Though marriage is a very good gift for God, we must not idolise marriage. And so I say to the unmarried, If we are unmarried 
or we feel discontentment around marriage, we need to remember that in Christ we have been given something far greater. And I'm going to finish with the parable of a kingdom. I will not finish with a parable about marriage. The kingdom is like a great pearl buried in a field. And when a man went it and found it, he sold everything he had and went and brought that field because the kingdom is so valuable. No matter who we are, no matter where we are in life, no matter where we stand, the greatest relationship, the most important relationship we can ever have is with Christ our God. There is nothing more valuable, more precious than the kingdom of God. Marriage serves to reflect that, but that is not the kingdom of God. It is a good gift from God, but the greatest thing and the greatest relationship we can ever share is with Christ our King. And if we feel discontentment around our marriage, we need to remember God is good and he has sent his bride for us all. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the good gift of marriage. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent the true bride into this world to sacrifice for us, that we might be a part of your kingdom forever and ever. As we think about marriage, as we think about the good gift of marriage and the standard you have set up, help us, Father, to be honest with ourselves where we fail to live up to that standard. Help us to make the loving sacrifices and the desire to be faithfully committed to each other in our marriages so as to serve you and help us not to be drawn away by the world which chases after so many foolish things. Help us to remain true to your standards and your good gifts that we might reflect your glory in all that we do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Apparently I've got all the answers, so if you've got any questions later, <laughs> let's stand and sing uh, to the praises of our King.
Well, let's do that now. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, I'm following the prayers on page 36 of the prayer book. If you want to follow along, uh, you're more than welcome. Let us pray for all people and for Christ's church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, through the Apostle Paul, you teach us to pray and to give thanks for all people. In your mercy, receive our prayers. Set the nations on the path of righteousness and peace. Lead their rulers to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare of all. Father, we pray for the ongoing war in the Ukraine with Russia. We pray, please, for peace. Uh, please, uh, we pray that the hostility would cease uh, and rebuilding can begin. Watch over the people who've been displaced. Uh, we pray as many refugees scatter throughout Europe that they'll be settled uh, and find accommodation and food and comfort uh, from their host nations. We pray for the leaders of our own nation, uh, especially for all who exercise uh, authority in this land, uh, both in governing uh, and making the rules, but also in the executive government, those who've got to uh, deal with it and put into effect and police it. Father, please in enable them to uh, uphold justice, to restrain wickedness and promote integrity and truth. Father, we know our uh, nation has been um, systematically uh, trying to wipe out your plans and purposes for life in this area of marriage and of relationships and of life. Father, we do pray for an undoing in the future of all the uh, more recent changes to uh, the abortion laws, to uh, euthanasia, to uh, gay marriage. Father, we do pray that the time would come when Christians would be able to rejoice at the direction that uh, we are travelling in. Father, we pray that politicians would be courageous uh, when they can see the truth and they would stand up for it, uh, even if it's unpopular. Father, we pray for integrity in that decision-making. Comfort and sustain merciful Lord, everyone in this fleeting life in sorrow, need, sickness or any other distress. Especially we pray today for those uh, who have gone through the pains and, and trials within their family life, for those who are widowed. We pray for your uh, love and comfort to know that uh, you are with them and uh, we pray, please, that you sustain them, give them the support they need, uh, particularly those who are older and uh, caring for themselves. We pray that you would bless them and watch over them. We pray for good friendships and support in their life as well to comfort and, and, and bring healing. We pray for those who've uh, been through the pain of separation and divorce. Uh, we pray, please, that you would sustain them uh, where there are things to, um, to deal with from the past. We pray that they would do business with you. Uh, and we do pray for uh, help and support in everything that they are going through as well. We pray for those who are in very difficult marriages at the moment for whatever reason. Father, please uh, help them to look to you for comfort and strength. We pray that they might be caused to lean on you and that through uh, suffering they might grow in uh, perseverance and character and hope. And we pray, please, that you would work changes in those marriages uh, to bring joy rather than uh, anger and hatred and disappointment. Father, please be at work. Pour out your spirit on your church so that all who acknowledge your holy name may agree in the truth of your word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace to all bishops and other ministers, especially we pray today for more college as it prepares ministers and missionaries for the future. Be with Mark Thompson and the, uh, the staff there, both the lecturers and the support staff. Help them to work well together, to grow, to uh, encourage one another uh, and to lead well as they develop these uh, young minds for future leadership in your church globally and in this diocese. Uh, Father, we pray that you will prosper the work of Moore College. Uh, we give grace to your people gathered here to receive your word with humble and obedient hearts and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. 
Father, we pray that we would uphold your views on marriage, uh, not just in our own personal lives, but as we talk with others, encourage them, point to you, and, uh, and help shape the next generations as well. We pray that we might be leaning on your understanding rather than ours and seeking to glorify you. We, pray for you, uh, we praise you for all who've died in the faith of Christ. Help us to follow their good examples that with them we may inherit your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. Almighty God, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, you made all things and you call everyone to account. With shame we confess the sins we have committed against you in thought, word and deed. We rightly deserve your condemnation. We turn from our sins and are truly sorry for them. They are a burden we cannot bear. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all that is past. Enable us to serve and please you in newness of life to your honour and glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has promised to forgive the sins of all who turned to him in faith and repentance, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, strengthen you to do his will and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. These words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. He said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. So lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Always and everywhere, it's right for us to praise you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. Therefore, with all those gathered around your throne in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name in words of never-ending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, Lord Most High. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your many and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We thank you, our Father, that in your love and mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our salvation. By this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and commanded us to continue a remembrance of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may be partakers of his body and blood. On... On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Now, last week, if you weren't here, we uh, reinstituted the uh, coming forward to share in communion together at the rail. Uh, we're going to try handing out the, the cups from the tray as you come round this week. Um, see if that's any better than what we did last week. So uh, I might ask Adam if you'd assist uh, with that. But please come and we'll share together in uh, the Lord's Supper.
pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, Dave, Dave's apparently running down the front to do it now. <laughs> Uh, I have three things to tell you about today. Uh, all of them are important in various ways. Two of them are new. There you go, so you haven't heard these announcements before. Here's the first one. We're making another church directory. It's been uh, long overdue. I know many of you in particular have been asking for one for a while. Now, uh, th there's a couple of things that is worth keeping in mind. We try and collect the data again, every directory, just to make sure that we're not using old information. So uh, we collect it electronically now rather than on bits of paper because we were making too many mistakes. And in order to do that, you go to barneysingleburn.com forward slash directory. If you have a handout from today, on the front page down the little side column, you will see that link there. If the thought of doing that scares you, I will be sitting at the back with a computer. As you leave today, you can do it. It also means we take new photos. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, David, I didn't do my makeup, right? The hair needs a haircut. I would have worn my best scarf, okay? But Joe, it's all right, okay, buddy? You'll you look fine anyway. The point is for you to be recognisable, not to have the most glamorous photo you possibly can. So the camera will be out, we'll be taking photos again. Now, as always, same rules for the directory. You only get a copy if you're in it. Just a little way of making sure that we limit who gets whose information. And this isn't something that we publish digitally. It doesn't get shared electronically. It's in the book, and that's the only place that this information appears. How much of your own information you want to be in there is up to you. You could just have your name if you wanted, although I recommend that you at least have one form of contact information in there, otherwise it makes it a bit pointless. We're also asking for your permission, as we collect this information, to put your name into a new prayer diary that we're putting together. More information on that later, but the point of that is just for people in church to be praying for you. If you would like that to happen, then tick yes. All right, church uh, directory is happening. Second thing I want to let you know about, and this is the other new announcement, this is coming from the parish council. Now, uh, if you were at the AGM, you might remember that one of the things that was put forward was the desire to purchase a house. Uh, we've got the sale from the church property at Glenfield from, from quite some time ago now, uh, and that money has really been sitting there for a little while. So it makes financial sense, even though our budget is we're behind budget, it makes financial sense to buy a house with that money, as that will help um, towards the rent that we're paying. So to be, able to, part, to be able to do that, there are two items of legal paperwork that need to get passed through the standing committee. Uh, one of those is about tidying up the trust that our property is held under and the other one is asking permission to take out a mortgage for whatever extra funds we need to buy the house. On the way in, on the big board on the side, you'll find a copy of the formal notice as well as the text of the ordinances and you'll also find them on our website, barneysingleburn.com forward slash ordinances. Uh, it's got all the information you need. Doesn't it just sound like legalese already and you're kind of glazing over? But here's the important bit. If you have an objection, if you have a problem with anything that's happening, that's where you'll find the contact details for Standing Committee so that you can get in touch with them directly. Right? That, that there's not, everything's being done above board. Uh, as always, of course, Wardens Parish Council, they're more than happy for you to ask uh, questions and, uh, and, and have them um, talk to you about it. And at this congregation, Kathy, I think, is, well, Kathy and Joe are the two members of Parish Council that you have uh, here today, so you can talk to them about it. The third thing to remind you about is church camp uh, coming up again. Sign up. I'll be sitting up the back with a laptop again today, so if you've been umming and ahhing, then you're going to have to walk past me today, so um, we'll have a bit of a chat about it, won't we? Let's uh, stand and sing together. This is going to be our offertory hymn. And so uh, the bags are going to come round. 
uh, uh, while we're singing, uh, if you want to make a, a cash contribution uh, to the ministry of this church, let's stand and sing. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. God bless. So
praise the Lord. 